should be streamed. We can hear. Oh. oh, hi everybody. Uh, so today's lecture is going to be uh, by Kelvin. Uh, he's a master student here at Georgia Tech. Um, so yeah. Hi, uh, as Tapraj introduced me, my name is Calvin, and I'll be uh, delivering the lecture for you today. Um, let me adjust it a little bit. Okay. So today we're going to be discussing about uh, number theory, and we're going to touch on topics like prime numbers and modular arithmetic, and then we're going to move on to other topics like um, in the areas of arithmetic. And hopefully uh, we could make this interesting, and hopefully we can make this uh, lecture edifying. So, um, so moving on to the first topic, we're going to be talking about prime numbers. Um, as some of you might know, prime numbers are those numbers that are greater than one, um, and so that are only divisible by itself and the number one. So we we don't conclude the number one, and as we know, the uh, the common numbers, as with a lot of you are familiar with, are Two, three, five, seven, eleven, and so on. And I think because this is very an in very interesting topic in terms of mathematics and computer science, um, it's been it's been a very large part of the focus in terms of uh, of how it interacts with uh, different systems. So I think it's important for us to be able to program and find those prime numbers. Now, there's no general formula for finding a prime number. If you do, uh, there's a one million dollar prize associated with it. So what we have to do instead is be able to actually sort of crank out these prime numbers one by one. And we're going to go and uh, write a method in Java. Um, I'm going to write it on the board. That's going to help you figure out how to find these prime numbers. So we know that prime numbers are, uh, we, know that prime, we know that prime numbers are only divisible by one in itself. So by that logic, it can't be divisible by anything that's smaller than it other than 1. And so that's the most basic way that we're going to start generating these prime numbers. So we can say um, we can have this as a public static function. We're going to return an array list. And we're going to call the function get prime. And so basically, we're going to have this function uh, return as many prime numbers as possible. Um, so, or we can constrain it, right? So we can say a long n, and we want to be able to find all prime numbers less than n. So we begin with a, uh, by creating a counter, right? We want to be able to just iterate through all these numbers and then figure out if all the numbers less than said number is a prime number. And if it is, we're going to add to this array list. So I'm going to initialize an array list filled with longs. And one of the reasons I'm using longs is because we want to be able to consider very large numbers. And in order to consider very large numbers, we might want to use a long instead of a integer. So results equals to new array list, simply instantiating it. And the reason why I'm using an array list as opposed to an array is because we're not quite sure how many uh, uh, prime numbers that we'll be able to find that's less than n. Usually that number is considered to be about the natural log of that number. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit after we look at this function and how that's important and how that's significant. Um, array. So there's your array list. Now we're going to create a for loop that's going to loop through all the numbers. So for int by, oh, actually, we're going to make this a long. And the reason why we're making a long is because we used a long right over there. And so we can do proper comparisons between the two. And we're going to start with the number 2 instead of 0 or 1. 
And the reason why is because one is uh, not a prime number. And so we're going to start with two. And we know two is a prime number, but we want this to be sort of uh, inclusive in terms of all the numbers that it considers. And while i is less than or equal to n, i plus plus. And then we're going to run an inner for loop to basically check. We're going to first have a uh, Boolean variable is prime. And we're going to set that to true. And we'll see why in a little bit. Right. And then we run a reverse for loop from this all the way back down to 2. This is, uh, um, so we say 4 long j. equals to i minus 1, while i is greater than 1. Ooh, sorry, while j is greater than 1, j minus minus. And so, as you can see here, what we have is we begin with this um, array list of results. Then we go and start considering all the numbers between 2 uh, and n, since we're trying to find all the numbers that are less than n. Then we try to uh, we set up a, um, a Boolean variable to test whether or not it is prime. And so we're going to run this reverse for loop. And, and uh, where was I? Ah. And so we say if. I modular j equals zero. Instead of just doing is prime equals to false, yeah, actually, yeah, we just set this as is prime equals to false. Right. And uh, and we're going to expand this a little bit. Apologize for the little messy, um, for this being a little messy. This goes right here, this goes up here, this goes right here. No, this goes right here. OK, so um, right, and inside this for loop, once we go check all the numbers that are less than that, um, we can. Uh, we can basically add it to the results array list that we created earlier. Results that add. I except apologies. That's if results if it is prime, then results. Dot add. add. Then escape this for loop. And then at the very end, we want to return results. Now let's analyze how complex this function is, right? You feed in a number n, and it'll return you a array list of, uh, of primes that are less than n. Let me go on this side. How long will this algorithm take? Um, this is an n squared algorithm. And we can see that because for each number, right, we have n numbers we consider. For each number, we consider half, um, we multiply it by itself to figure out whether or not it's, uh, uh, to figure out, uh, to fi uh, sorry, we multiply all the smaller numbers to figure out whether or not the number is uh, bigger or smaller than. Uh, whether the number is actually prime. So as you can see in this instance, we have this outer for loop, which goes through n iterations. And this one goes through n minus 1 iterations. Sorry, the i iterations. And that actually comes out to be uh, n, uh, n squared. But more appropriately, it's actually n squared over 2. When we consider big O analysis, we drop any constants. So we only consider the n squared aspect of it. 
Now, this is a very tedious algorithm, and so we're going to discuss in a bit how we can improve this algorithm. But before we can do that, we have to talk a little bit more about primes and some of the insights that we can glean from it. Now, uh, we have now there's some interesting proofs, there's some interesting properties of primes that we, we should consider and we should look at. The first one came from a very long time ago. I believe um, Aristotle was the one that sort of proved that there could be an infinite number of primes. Um, and I think that's very interesting to consider and look at. Um, the proof goes like this. Uh, it says that assume, and it's a proof by contradiction. It says assume that there is um, a finite number of primes, right? So then the product, right, of all those, uh, let's, let's the, uh, the product of all these primes of P1, P2, P3, to Pn, um, take the product of all these primes, and then add 1 to it. And then, provably, you actually cannot divide any of these numbers by uh, either P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 all the way to Pn. And because of that, that number cannot be divisible by any of them, so that number must also be prime in that context. But this isn't a way to generate primes. I don't want you to confuse you with that. There, um, this can very much come up with a composite number as opposed to a prime number. Composite being non-prime numbers that's also greater than one. And so this is simply just a proof that there is not a finite number of primes. And so it's, it's very interesting when you consider the, uh, the inc increment the number by one and then how it becomes a new set of prime numbers. And so that's one insight that we have. The second insight that we want to be able to have in order to help improve this algorithm is if you want to consider the parity of prime numbers. So if a number is divisible by, um, if a number is not prime, then there are a set of numbers for which you can actually multiply them together to get the following number. But they always come in pairs of some sort, unless they're perfect squares. So let's talk about the number six. Right. It's clearly not prime. There's two and three. But if we were to list all the numbers between there, we have one, six, and then we have two times three. Um, four is obviously not a, a um, divisible. Uh, by, um, four cannot divide six, and neither can five. But two and three can div uh, divide six, and so it comes in these kind of pairs. Again, if we were to consider an example like 36, right, we have one and 36, two, and... Uh, 2 and 18, 3 and 12, we have 4 and 9, 5 doesn't divide, 6 divides by 6, and because they're the same number, we can just put down 1, 6. And as you can see, these are all paired together like that. And it's interesting to consider this pairing when you, uh, when you sort of design this function, because it'll actually speed up uh, the amount of work that you have to do by a, a lot. So instead of actually considering this entire list of numbers, all we have to do is only consider this many numbers. But how many is this many numbers? It's not half. It's the square root of that number. And that makes sense because the square root is the central point. That's where the parity lies. We have to consider also the square root because we don't want to miss over a, something that's square of a prime number like 9 or like 121. And so, uh, so instead of running through this and have an n squared result, we can actually change part of this so that it actually considers only the square root number instead of the entire number of instances. And so we're going to change this function as follows. So we have for long j equals to i minus 1. And instead, actually, we're going to turn this for loop around so we can deal with smaller numbers. And smaller numbers are a lot more efficient to do computations with. So we have for long j equals to 2, because we know that if it's just 1, then it's really not all that meaningful, um, while um, Sorry. Well, j is less than or equal to math dot square root oh. 
root of i j plus plus. And then we can do the same the same logic as before. If i modulo j equals zero, then is prime equals false. And so uh, and so as you can see, this is much more efficient than the previous algorithms. And in fact, we have instead of n squared, we have transferring this to n to 3 over 2. Or as you can see it, because we only do a square root number of operations here as opposed to uh, an n number of operations, we have n time, we iterate this through this n times, we only iterate through this square root number of times. So that's n times square root of n, which is equivalent to n to the 3 over 2. Now we're going to actually work on improving this function even further. And uh, this part gets a little trickier. It's not just a simple number manipulation. Um, first of all, a small machine optimization, and also computational logistic, is to, instead of actually do j is less than or equal to math that square root of i, because the square root function takes a very long time to compute. Relative, relatively speaking, um, it takes about 20 times the um, operation, the time it takes to do a multiplication or addition operation. So instead of doing math that square root, we could just do while j times j is less than or equal to i. So that's a minor optimization. So going back to a more pre uh, historic way of computing primes is we're going to talk about a prime sieve. Um, a prime sieve is, uh, is a method that people have invented a very long time ago in order to try to figure out how many prime numbers are less than that. And so... So the prime sieve starts out like, so if we have a list of numbers, uh, let me rewrite this. Right, and then we uh, just begin to start crossing out all the numbers that are uh, prime or not prime, right? So we begin by saying 1 is not prime. Since 2 is available, we circle 2. And then the next step is we take out all the multiples of 2 in this instance. So we have 2, we cross out the 4, cross out the 6, cross out the 8, cross out the 10, cross out the 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. We look at the next number. Since it's not crossed out, we circle it. It's another prime. And then we begin by crossing out all the number multiples of 3. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, um, six, um, 15, 18, and then 21. When we go to the next number, we see that it's a 5. Um, well, 4 is crossed out, so we know that that's not prime. We see 5 available, so we cross out all multiples of 5. It's already done. C7. Try to cross out all the multiples. It's already done. 11, 13, 17, 19. And that's, that's the prime sieve. Now, this is actually a very surprisingly uh, fast operation, assuming that you can cross out all the prime numbers by themselves. Now, we won't go through the proof of this, but this is actually a log log time algorithm or a super log function. And so this is really quick, but the thing that takes the most amount of time is actually going through all the numbers and crossing them out one by one. And that, unfortunately, still takes an n square number of times, because we're, well, actually, just a linear number of times for every prime that we find. And so that really does add, add up after a bit. And uh, But I think we want to take the intuition, right? That if we can actually just locate the primes and cross out all its multiples, that will eventually um, result in the answer that we're looking for. And so the way we're going to do that is to exploit certain features of this list. Again, let's go back to the example of 36. Right? We have... 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 12, um, 18, and 36. We have all these pairings, 
right? We have 4, 9, 3, 12, 2, 18, 136. We really don't have to consider pairings like 4, because if we know that if it's divisible by 4, then it's also divisible by 2, right? In the same sense that we, we don't really care about whether or not it's divisible by 9 or 6, if we already know that 3, it's already divisible by 3. So by that logic, we only have to check the number of prime numbers. And because prime numbers are what we consider sparse, right? There's only a uh, f there's there's only a log number as we as I talked about the actual log number of primes in a given range. Then that's going to be a lot quicker in terms of trying to find out this number than than the previous methods, right? So again, over here, as you can see, if we're talking about a number like 36, this algorithm will go log j equals to two, fine. Three, fine, right? Oh, actually, they're, they're not fine, right? But it's also going to start checking four. It's going to also check six before it starts, be, before it terminates. So we don't want it to check four. We don't want to check six. We only want to check at all the prime numbers that are less than that. And more interestingly, we only want to check all the prime numbers that are square root less than that. So let's change the logic here so that uh, we were able to do that. So. In order, so one convenient thing, right? is that we already have an array list called results that stores all the primes that we found up to this point. So we can actually take advantage of that to sort of make a, um, to sort of speed up this logic right here. Since we still have to sort of look at every single number, we can f uh, speed up how quickly we determine whether or not it's prime. So, um, so yeah, so we, instead of log j equals to one, right? We're actually going to change this part of the logic almost entirely. I'm going to say if uh, 4 int i equals to 0, so we're going to do a, a more interesting logic, right? Because this is this is the uh, terminating condition, or the uh, one of the conditions that ke keeps us sustaining. We can do um, results. Dot get i. Times results dot get i is less than or equal to oh sorry in j dot get j dot get j yeah it's a it's a mistake that people commonly make um, when they do nested for loops is as they sometimes confuse the variables here um, so as you can see here we have if int j equals to zero, if the results, if one of the primes in here times another prime in here is less than j, then we continue to start evaluating the sequence. And then we can do if i modular results dot get j before equals zero then is prime equal to false. Right, and this is just a much faster way of being able to figure out um, all the prime numbers in, in this series. Now we can do other optimizations, right? So we can, uh, and these are more minor, minor and more trivial, I would say. And so one of the optimizations that we can make is to label this for loop. Right? So we can call this for loop L1. And then after we find the first first thing that makes it not prime, then we know that it's not prime. We don't have to check the other variables. So we can say uh, break L1, and it breaks out of the loop. Now, usually you actually don't even need this L1 loop because the break would actually break out of the first loop that it's part of. But it's nice to label things so that when you when you revisit the code, when you're trying to debug, you can have a clearer understanding of where it's breaking to and where you can look at look at the um, look at the errors, etc. Right. So we break L1, 
Another optimization we can make, but this is a little trickier, right, is realize that one of the most simplest prime is number two. It's the only even prime. And when we go through each of the numbers, we can actually skip over all its, uh, all its, uh, um, all its, um, all the numbers that are less than two, right? And so I guess one hack, if you will, is to actually just right here, uh, not right here, right here, write um, results that add two. And what this allows us to do, right, is to have this be three. And then instead of i plus plus, we can do i plus equals to two. And that way we can skip over all the numbers that are uh, even. Now, I guess the one tricky thing is if n is ever less than two, and then we don't actually want to cons uh, we actually want to return an empty, re an empty result. So we can, we can do that very quickly by saying, if n is less than two, return results. It's very hacky, but it does cut down a lot on the overall computation. And, you, and so this algorithm right here is instead of n raised to the two, that was what we previously had, right? Is we actually have um, n times log to the one half n. And this is a lot faster than uh, the previous algorithms that we considered. And the reason why it's log here is because, as we said before, there's only going to be a log number of primes within a certain within a certain by a certain number. And so that's what we have for prime numbers. Okay. Cool. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, it doesn't seem like people tend to be asking questions, but um, if you have any questions, I'll check the uh, questions area, the comments area on the video periodically. The next topic that we want to cover is this notion of, uh, of numbers that are relative to one another, right? We have the absolute prime numbers. The absolute prime numbers being numbers that can um, that are prime because they're only divisible by one in itself, right? And then we have this notion of numbers that are relatively prime. Numbers that are relatively prime are numbers that are prime, I guess, relative to one another. And I, uh, this will make sense once I give an example, right? We know that the number four isn't prime, right? But we know, uh, but we also know that seven is prime. But four is relatively prime to seven because they share no common divisors. Right, if we do 4 over 7, then you can't simplify this fraction. Whereas if I give you something like 8 over 14, it reduces to 4 over 7. So we say 8 and 14, they're not relatively prime to one another. And this notion of relative primeness is also important in computation, but also important in just everyday math. Think about every single time when you, um, in sort of, an introductory algebra class where they give you a fraction and you need to simplify it. You need to simplify it down until they become relatively prime. And being able to figure out whether or not they are relatively prime is, is uh, pretty practical and also very important. And so, and so we are going to uh, talk about briefly about how to figure out things like GCD and the least common multiple. All right. So just one second. Okay. So, the way we're going to figure out what the GCD or the greatest common denominator of two numbers is going to be is we're going to sort of, we're going to define a recursive function. A recursive function is a function that calls itself so that when it throughout its execution it goes and reintroduces itself over and over again. And so we're going to call this function GCD, And we're going to use longs again, just so we can handle very large numbers, just in case the problem mandates really large numbers. And we do long a and long b. We also want to uh, 
return um, oops so this public static right and it's a very short function all we want to do is return the GCD of B comma a minus the floor floor of a over right or we can actually express this as gcd of b comma a mod b And of course, you have to define the base cases, right? That um, if if GCD ever equal is a comma zero, right? So if um, so, even before this, right? We do put the brackets for definition. You don't even need that big. We uh, can say if b equals to zero, return a. Else return gcd b comma a mod b. And so this is the very quick uh, gcd greatest common denominator function um, method that'll, that'll quickly um, get you, and it's really easy to code and it'll get you the results that you need, being that the greatest common divisor between the two. Now if, if we put A and B and the greatest common divisor, GCD, equals to one, then we know that they're relatively primed to one another, and I think that's an important notion that, to understand. Right? Now, visiting a concept that we are kind of glossed over but sort of didn't sort of probably needed to focus more on is this new, is this little percentage sign right here that we see a lot in uh, in both this um, in this method and also the prime method that we talked about. In, the way I checked for whether or not um, a is divisible by b is to check if a mod b that's what the percentage sign says is equal to zero, and I'll I'll talk about that in just a second. And so this is the part where we begin talking about modular arithmetic, and then we can start beginning begin an intuition for why the GCD of um, of a comma b is equal to the GCD of b comma a mod b. Modular arithmetic. So modular arithmetic is sort of the discussion about how many time, well, how many multiples of something something happens to be. So if we say um, you have the number seven, right, and if we take mod three as an example, we get one. And the reason that we get one is because it's um, if we divide seven by three, we get a remainder of one. And in that sense, mod could also could almost be thought of as the remainder when you divide this number by that number, right? Um, to give you a larger example, we can have the number uh, 27, and then uh, 127, right? And then we're going to divide that by five, mod, mod five. Now we can take. We can do the long division. I know uh, I haven't done this. Um, it's people don't usually do long divisions anymore, right? But we can have two, ten, and we can have five, twenty-five, and two. So it's twenty-five remainder two. We can throw out this twenty-five, and so one hundred twenty-seven mod five equals to two. Now this is used to a great effect for several different reasons, right? This modular arithmetic, like prime numbers, are very effective in terms of using for uh, computer science applications like cryptography and security. 
but also because modular arithmetic helps simplify really large numbers. There's, there's a lot of properties of numbers that gets preserved when we use modular arithmetic to convert one number over another, where new properties become introduced that simplifies a lot of different kind of computation. Be because of that interest and for that purpose, we want to um, sort of try to exploit and use um, modular, arithmetic, uh, modular arithmetic to the best of our abilities. So we have 127 mod 5, actually. So, so let's begin trying to start by sort of developing an intuition for why modular arithmetic works in the GCD instance. So let's say we're given a number of 36 and 27. GCD of these two. So the algorithm would dictate that this is equivalent to GCD of uh, 27 comma 36 mod 27. Right. And so notice that um, when inverting these things, oh, I'll get to that in a bit. So then we have that's equivalent to GCD of 27. And the, basically, because um, 36 is greater than 27, but is um, not greater than twice 27, we can just subtract 36 by 27, to get 9. Right? Um, and then we can do equal to GCD, 9, 27, sorry. Nine mod twenty-seven, okay, and that's actually just equal to uh, GCD of nine comma nine. Um, but taking it a step further, that equals to the GCD of nine comma nine mod nine, and that's equal to zero. So that equals to GCD of nine comma zero. And we know that to be the answer 9. So as you can see, 9 is in fact the greatest common divisor between those two numbers. And so that's how we arrived at it. What happened if we switch the numbers? And we can actually take a look at what happened then. If we switch the numbers, um, we're going to work through it quickly instead of talking it out this time. Right. We have 36. Oh, did I switch the numbers? Right, we have 36, and then we have 27 mod 36. But 27 mod 36, since 36 is greater than 27, and so when we divide them, the remainder is only going to be 27. So that just equals to GCD of 36 minus 27. And we already know that this gets us the right answer. So you can see that in this one step alone, um, it flips it, inverts it, if you will, so that it gets into a prior state that we already know that concludes to an answer. And so, again, if we want to talk about the intuition between them, right, we're looking for the difference, the modular difference between them. So another way to write modular arithmetic is, um, so A mod B equals to a minus b times the floor of a over b. And this is what I wrote beforehand. And so, and so basically at every, at every step, we're taking away the same multiples of one of the numbers, right? And so when we take away the multiples of these numbers over and over again, we, we notice that the divisibility of the entire system still stays the same. So when we take a mod b, we know that when we take away a, um, um, when we when we take away when we take away a, we have um, oh sorry when we take away twenty um, thirty six from twenty seven, it's um, of course that's not actually a very good example. So we're going to do the next step. So we're going to have 27, and we have uh, 
36 mod 27. And the reason why this step works is because what we have here essentially is we're, we're taking 27 away from here. And when we do that, we actually sort of, we almost preserve that number. So we can actually even write that as 36 minus 27, right? And then we can have 27 here. It's equivalent to. And then when we take it this step further, we can do Thirty-six minus twenty-seven. Minus twenty-seven, and we see similar results. So I think that's sort of the intuition that you want to build up in terms of uh, because because these numbers are carrying from one area to the other. That's one of the reasons why uh, algebraic arithmetic helps contribute to being able to calculate GCD. There's some other interesting properties about uh, greatest common denominator as well. So, um, in terms of modular arithmetic, when we do things like addition, for example, so when we do a plus b mod n, that's equal to a mod n, uh, a mod n plus b mod n, and the whole thing mod n. And the intuition here we have, right, is that if we have A, right, let's say it's this length, right, and B, which is this length, when we, when we try to figure out the remainder of the uh, modular of, let's say, some length N, right, we can either build out N pieces here, and let's say we have this little cylinder left, and then keep building these blocks of N that sort of gets removed on this series, and the remainder gets sort of summed up here. But we can do the exact same process, right? And we can have A here, and obviously this isn't perfect at the scale, right? And then we can just sort of removing these N. We, know, we notice that, um, or to draw this appropriately, we have this little bit left over, and then when we draw these blocks of N here, there's nothing left over. And so this little piece is preserved. Now the reason why we want to sort of make this um, as large as possible is we, just in case these instances are where a equals to n minus 1 and a mod n is, and b a mod n is n minus 1, we want to be able to mod that n again or else we get a number greater than n. So in that instance, um, that's why we want to be able to mod n in these instances. And so pro nice properties like these allow for us to work with really big numbers. And then we can also see that being able to arrive at certain numbers require these parities and symmetries and very complicated properties in modular arithmetic. And so being able to exploit that is definitely very uh, helpful and beneficial. Okay. One second. The next topic that we're going to talk about is geometry. So geometry is very interesting, especially when applied to computer science. Now we've always, so uh, we have had a lot of experience as, you know, as society, for when dealing with geometry basically on pen and paper. We look at a circle, right, we say a point, a circle, and we start talking about the properties of a circle, and we can build triangles and try to find out its uh, various centers, etc. And you can do the exact same thing on a computer. What you have to do instead from converting geometry topics into a into basically topics in computer science is being able to actually represent these things mathematically and understand basically sort of sort of the same way how you visualize it in your head, but define it so that you, the computers themselves can start visualizing. So for example, right, when we talk about a circle, we say, what is the smallest definition necessary for a circle? Now there's multiple right answers to that question. One possible right answer is we have a center, right? And then we have the radius. That is, in fact, one definition of circle. Or we can have any non three collinear points. That's the definition of a circle. Or we can talk about the circle that's um, inscribed within a triangle that's also a unique circle. And so on and so forth. These are all legitimate representations of circles. And we want to be able to actually uh, 
get as much. We want to be able to sort of represent these things in a various way. So you can imagine this as a um, as three numbers, depending on your coordinate system, right? We can have the x comma y. These are two numbers for the center. And then we can have um, one number r for the radius. In this instance, we need six numbers. The coordinates of the triangle, or um, or um, and in this instance, we also need the same six numbers to do the coordinates of the outer triangle. So this is the inner triangle, right? This is the outer triangle, and so we're going to deal with more interesting ideas than this. And we're going to begin with the notion of a point, right? So a point. A point is a number that has an x minus coordinate. Or we're going to assume two dimensions. But obviously, this could go into z and so on and so forth. We want to work in multiple dimensions. But for the sake of visualization, because I only have a two dimensional board, we're going to assume that the geometry in question is in two dimensions. Now, we have a point. We can just list them as two numbers. We can keep them as an array. We can create a point object, or we can just just store these two numbers in some kind of in well ordering, and the well ordered numbers would just basically be our collection of points. And then we have um, let's introduce another point right here, right? Now let's call that s comma t. And now, if we want, we can actually start defining a line, a line between x y and s t. And that's the beginning of geometry. That's the foundation of geometry is just this notion of this line. Right. And then we can start looking at other things. Right? So if we want to introduce um, another line from x, y, um, um, v, w. Right? And then we can introduce another line from v, w to s, t. And thus we have a triangle. And we, we can sort of implicitly assume some kind of uh, configuration or some kind of information like this. Um, so let's talk about polygons then. Polygons are shapes that are closed, made up of a number of lines, and that, that don't cross each other. So this, for example, could be a polygon. Right? And this is a very weirdly drawn polygon. But this is a 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 23 sided polygon, right? And so in this 23 sided polygon, um, in this 23 sided polygon, we can, um, we can sort of think of it as shapes. That is an, and oftentimes this is very important when we want to sort of approximate real shapes in the real world. So when we have this polygon, we can sort of um, we sort of we can sort of define them as these points, and we can sort of traverse them clockwise relative to any starting point. Um, it really doesn't matter because when you rotate these polygons, they still maintain their shape. So we can pick the top point or the bottom point. Just for convenience, we're going to pick the top point. Right? And point here, point here, point here, point here, point here. Point here. And so we have a polygon that's defined as thus. One interesting thing you can do in mathematics is to actually sort of coming up and see relationships of these points that they have with one another. And so what I'm going to teach you is a very neat way to figure out the area of these shapes without, um, by just knowing these points in the coordinate system. Um, so, so we're going to begin with a very simple example of a triangle. Right? We know that there's many ways to figure out the area of a triangle. Just to review, and this will probably be a review for some of you, um, we can... We can find the height and the base, and we can multiply them together. Or we can use something called Heron's formula, which is the square root of s being the semi-perimeter. Let's call these sides length a, b, and z. Right? Semi-perimeter is half of a plus b plus c. Semi-perimeter is of s minus a, s minus b, s minus c. We'll get you the area of triangle ABC. Alternatively, some people know this um, knows the matrix form. So in case you don't know these side lengths, right? We we let's say this is point A, point B, point C, right? 
we can have um, we can have a matrix here, and we can call it a x x of a, right? And we have y of a, so this is the x and y coordinate of this point a. One, x of b, y of b, one. X of C, Y of C, 1. And half of that will give us half of that will give us the um, the um, area. Half of the absolute value of this, this could be negative for example, will give us the area of the triangle in question. And this to find the determinant of the system, we basically just multiply X A, Y A, right? Multiply it this way and multiply it this way. So what we have here is X of A times y of b, and then we have uh, y of a um, times x of c times um, x of b times y of c. And then we have to minus, uh, subtract the upward flowing diagonals. And so we have uh, x of a times y of c, and this is minus minus um, y of a minus x of b times x of b minus x of c times y of a. And so to make this a little prettier, if you will, we really have what this equals to is x of a times y of b minus x of b times y of a plus uh, y of a times, um, sorry, x of b times um, y of c minus x of c times y of b. And then we add um, we add uh, uh, x of c times y of a minus y of a, sorry, the x of a times the y of c. And so when we multiply all these chains together, what we end up having is the area. Take the half of that and that becomes the area of the system. Now we're going to expand these concepts. Notice how we have these segments right here. Right? We have, when we have pairs of coordinate points, x a, y a, and we have coordinates points a, y, y of a, sorry, what? We have x of b, y of b, and we have coordinates points x of a, y of a, and we have points x of b, y of b. We actually, we, we when we put when we put them together, there's a very noticeable pattern down here. Of where we take this and um, add this and subtract that, and that's the exact same thing that's going on here. Now, if we're going to expand that to uh, beyond a triangle, what we interestingly have is we actually have a formula for solving the entire area of a polygon, as long as it's closed and as long as it's not crossing. So even some kind of crazy shape like this, assume that they're straight lines. And assume that they're not crossing right here. This could be figured out by a formula that's taking the um, the cross of these, multiply them together, and then subtracting one by the other. And this is actually called the cross product. So the general formula for figuring out the area of this polygon is um, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We basically have the sum of of x of i plus sorry x of i times y of i plus one minus x of i plus one times y of i and so I guess uh, I guess we're sort of, we'll code this so that this makes more sense because it is a programming lecture instead of just a sh pure straight math lecture. So assume that you're given a um, an array list of integers, right? Array list of ints 
and let's say these will be the size of two, so we can have um, so we can have the zero indice be the x value, and the y indice be the uh, sorry, the then the first uh, y indice be the first and in the position one, and the x value being the position of zero, right? So polygon points. Or say no, let's just be given these in a file, right? So given these points in a file, right? For int i equals to zero, i is less than or equal to. Well, let's do less than for now. Polygon points. That length. Plus plus. Just checking to make sure I'm not confusing anyone or if nobody has any questions. Huh. So um, I is less than re less than polygon points dot length I plus plus, and so. We are going to constantly try to check the cross product of these uh, points that we're given here. So we have i is so we're going to do a uh, double a equals to zero point zero going to keep track of the running area, right? So a equals to one half of um, zero times polygon One of one minus one half of polygon points. So five plus one zero times polygon points. I one. And so, um, and so, uh, basically, this would be uh, we will iterate through all these points, and this would eventually return us the area. The one thing we do have to consider is that because we have this i plus one, we actually can't make this um, the length of the array. We actually have to make it the length of the array minus one, and then we will have to just basically, in order to close the circle because of the circular nature, we have to. Um, uh, consider we have sort of have to hard cut the very last point. So we have a, and this is plus e, plus equals to, plus equals to one half of polygon points. I really should have just named this PP of One zero times one point. Oh, probably should have added dot get here. So zero, one, 
minus one half of polygon. Now remember we have to do them in the right order, right? Because when we flip them around, the answers might be negative, right? So, but we have to actually be consistent about um, the order in which we do these cross products, right? Polygon points. Okay. Wait, this one would be one, zero, one, times. Yeah. I really should have just named the function pp. pp dot length minus one. Zero. And then we want to take the uh, math dot absolute value of a because again the number could be negative but it will be the right magnitude. And so when we take the absolute value, we get the appropriate area. And so um, this would be, um, I think this would uh, result, yeah. And so this is sort of one way of figuring out the uh, area of the polygon. Now let's, let's, let's sort of explain why this works, which I think is really interesting. Really fascinating actually. So we have so we have this polygon shape, right? Um, so when we have two not two um, two points, right, in space, and when we consider the cross product of an area, right? So these are the two areas. What we're actually doing one interesting thing about the number of the cross product is that the answer is actually the um, is this parallelogram that's being created here. And this parallel and the cross product of A and B is equal to the area of this. So interestingly, if we take half of that, and this is what we do consistently, okay, we get just this triangle shape. And direction of A and B matters, right? So, so let's say this is A, B, right? Half of AB, half of A cross B, right, um, is equal to the negative of the half of B cross A. And let's talk about that implication when we try to draw a shape like this. Okay? Let's say this is the shape that we kind of want to figure out in this coordinate system. What we have in the first cross product, product is we can create this vector, right, and we sort of shade this part. And this is the part that we just added, right? In the next one, we sort of add this shape. Yeah. But then the next step, what we do is then we are cutting back here. When we cut back here, we essentially erase all the added gains we have here. When we cut back here, we erase the gains that we get here, and then we add back this area, which is countered by this negative deficit that we created here. And at the very end, you get this, in the conclusion, you get this area that you have here, and this is basically how you have it. So again, it's just, Basically, cross product of all the series of points in the same direction, take the absolute value, and divide that by half, and get the area of the polygon. So I think that's a very fascinating, very simple, and very profound uh, trick that you can do in, uh, in geometry that I think is very uh, beneficial. So I want to thank you very much for watching this, uh, this stream. Um, hopefully, you were able to get a lot of stuff out of this. Um, so yeah, I will, we will hopefully see you next week.